Hi, I'm Mickey Jaco. A few years ago I posted a video called Solving 20 Common Computer Problems. Here are some more tips for normal people doing normal things now for Windows 10. The Favorites Bar in Windows 10. Say you want to get Amazon.com onto your Favorites Bar. Bring up the Amazon website, click on this star at the right, click on this down arrow, select favorites bar click add and it puts it up onto your favorites bar if you wanted to just keep it not on the bar but only in a favorites list you'd click the down arrow and select favorites and click on save now it's gone from the favorites bar and it's just in your list which you can find under this three line icon Note that you can switch between just icons or full name tabs by right clicking the favorites bar and selecting either show names and icons or show icons only. In Private Browsing, incidentally, is over here under the three-dot icon. The Search function in Windows 10. Windows 10 has a thing called Cortana, where you just speak out a question and it finds an answer for you. I don't really like it. What I usually do is just type a question into Google, like this, and get an answer there. For normal searches, I click on the Windows Start button, and then without clicking on anything else, I just start typing what I'm looking for, say a document with the word giraffe in it. A window pops up showing what I'm typing at the bottom here. Then I go up here to the Filters Down arrow, click the one I want, Documents, and it brings up all my documents with the word giraffe in it, with the best match up at the top. I click on it to open it. I look in here, and here's the word giraffe in this document. If you're already in a document and want to know what folder it's in, click File at upper left, then at the lower right, click Open File Location. Then to return to your document, X out that window and click the arrow at the upper left here. The Settings function. One of the nice features in Windows 10 is a search box for finding settings. I used to have to search all over the control panel until I finally found the place to change a particular setting. Now you can do this. Click the Windows Start icon, click the Setting icon, then type in the setting that you're looking for. Say my cursor is too thin for my liking. I type in cursor and it brings it up. Click on change how thick the cursor is. I like it at 3 but say I wanted it thicker so I can see it better I'd drag the marker over to 5. Then X out that window and now I have a cursor that's easier to see. If I wanted to change the look of my pointer I'd type pointer into the settings box. Click on themes Mouse cursor, pointers tab at upper left. Drop down arrow under scheme. Here's the default one. I like the extra large black one here. Click OK. 
If I wanted to change my desktop background, I'd type in desktop background. Click on background. If you click on a picture, you get that picture as a background. Personally, even though they have a lot of beautiful pictures, I don't like my screen to be any busier than it already is, so I usually select a solid plain color. Another setting preference you might want to change is your taskbar. I like the automatic hiding of the taskbar and the small taskbar buttons. So all these settings can be found by clicking the settings gear and typing in the setting you're looking for. Changing window sizes. In Windows 10, if you drag a window to the corner, the window pops into one quarter screen size. If you drag it to a side, as soon as your pointer hits the edge, the window pops into half screen size. And any items you had open pop up on the other side. Click on one of those items and it automatically puts it up to half size on the other side so that you can compare the files and work at them side by side. If you want just your desktop on the left, just click on any empty spot. Home page setting. Say you're a sports fan and you want your home page to be ESPN. Get ESPN up, copy the URL, click the three dots over here at the right, click settings down the bottom. Under open MS edge with a specific page or pages, X out what's under there and a new box opens up showing enter a URL. Paste the URL there, click on the save button, now when you click on MS Edge, it will open up to ESPN as your home page. Or if you prefer, as I do, to open up normally directly to your email, use the same procedure pasting in your email URL. The icon migration problem. Upon rebooting my computer, I've always had the problem of my desktop icons migrating to the left in random order so that I have to laboriously put them back to where I had them. I've tried a bunch of things to avoid this. My best solution, first, consolidate some of your icons into category folders so that you have fewer icons in total on your desktop. Then right-click Desktop, View, Check Align to Grid, arrange the icons where you want them, then right-click the desktop again and uncheck Align to Grid. When Align to Grid is unchecked, I find that the icons are far less likely to migrate left. Don't accidentally check Auto Arrange Icons or it'll move all your icons over to the left and you can't undo that action with a Control Z. And you'll have to laboriously put them all back manually. An external DVD player. Most laptops these days no longer have a built-in disc player. So if you want to play a CD or DVD in your computer or burn a disc, you have to buy an external disc player. The good news is that they're not expensive. Mine costs about 40 bucks and they are easy to use. No configuration setup or password or whatever. You just attach it with its USB cord and it works exactly like an internal disc player. Desktop shortcuts for programs or websites. In Windows 10, getting a shortcut for a program onto your desktop is easy. You just find it in your apps list and drag it out onto your desktop. And it puts not the app itself, but a shortcut to the app onto your desktop. Getting a website shortcut onto your desktop is a little trickier. What you do is get your site up, let's say Amazon, select the URL, right click to copy it, X out the site, right click an empty spot on the desktop, new, shortcut, paste in the URL, next, 
name it, Amazon, finish. And there you have it. Gadgets. I used to have what they call gadgets on my desktop, small Microsoft single purpose apps that give you the weather or stock market or calendar or whatever, but Microsoft no longer supports them. And if I downloaded a free gadget from the internet, I always felt they were trying to trap me into buying something, or worse, would leave me vulnerable to some sort of malware attack. So what I do now is I find a preferred website that would be the equivalent of a, of a gadget and put a shortcut for it onto the desktop. For example, instead of a weather gadget, I googled local weather and I got a good site. I made a shortcut on the desktop for it by the procedure I described earlier. That way, my favorite bar has the sites I use a lot, but my desktop has the apps or sites I use the most, those that I want immediately accessible. The snipping tool. I've become a big fan of this tool. I noticed the Best Buy Geek Squad guy using it, and he said, yeah, he likes to use it a lot. It's like the print screen key at the top right of your keyboard, except that instead of taking a picture of the whole screen, you can draw a rectangle around the part of the screen that you want a picture of. Click Start. If you can't find it in your apps list, type in Snipping Tool. Click on it. Click New. Drag the plus sign to mark an area that you want captured. Right click. Copy. Paste it into whatever document you want. Auto correct in Windows 10. If there are words you don't like to spell all the way out but want them automatically filled in, for Windows 10, click File at upper left. Options down the bottom, proofing it upper left, auto correct options, say you don't like to type the full word Microsoft, enter capital MS here and Microsoft at the right. Click add and OK. Now, every time you type in MS in a text, it automatically puts in the whole word Microsoft as soon as you hit the spacebar. Copying a file versus moving a file. I bring this up because it's so important. If you drag a file to an external hard drive or a flash drive, it will make a copy that original file still exists in its original location. But if you drag a file from a place within your computer to another place within your computer, you are moving it and that file will no longer exist in the original location. You don't want to lose a file because you thought it was still in the original folder when it wasn't. Shortcuts versus actual files. I recommend not putting actual files on your desktop, but only their shortcuts. Note the blue arrow shortcut icons I have here. These are shortcuts, not actual files. Putting actual files on the desktop, I think, only adds another layer of confusion in keeping track of where your files are located. Just keep them where you always keep them, and if you are currently working on them, use shortcuts on your desktop to reach them. Right-click the file, send to desktop.
So here's the shortcut from which you can access the file. Note that you can determine the location of a file from the shortcut by right-clicking it. Then when you're done, you can drag the shortcut into your bin, and the actual file remains right where it always was. Another advantage of using this procedure is that when you do a major backup of your files, you don't accidentally leave out a few you still had left up on the desktop, because you forgot to return them to their normal locations. Display of files in folders. This little icon up here hides or displays your ribbon toolbar. Up here under the View tab you can change how your folder items are displayed as a list, as large icons, medium icons, whatever your preference is. I find the Details mode is useful because you can sort or reverse sort your items by clicking Name or by Date by clicking Date Modified. You can navigate up to higher folders by clicking on this up arrow. Notice how I move to the left here into higher and higher folders until I actually get to my desktop items. Then you can use the left arrow over here to get back to where you were. Line spacing. You can get the line spacing you prefer by clicking up here on the toolbar ribbon. First highlight what you want to change. Myself, I, I tend to like Arial Narrow for saving space and ink, and 12 point size. Then I click the down arrow on this icon in the paragraph box, line spacing, I pick 0, and 6, which is about half a line space, and single. So it looks like this. I find myself doing this a lot because since I often copy internet texts of all different sizes and fonts and so forth, I want to get the text into a form that I like. Word count function. Your status bar at the far lower left normally gives you a document page count and a word count. If you don't see the word count, right click the status bar and make sure word count is checked. I find this feature very useful for keeping track of how many words I have in an essay. If you block a section, it tells you how many words are in that section. Here it's 154 out of 2,731 words. If you click on the word words, it will also give you a character count if you want that. Incidentally, you can move block sections left or right quickly with these two icons up here. Kindle note taking. I don't know if other people are like me, but I often take notes on the more serious books I read so I can refer back to its key ideas or quotes in the future. And here's the way I do it for my books on Kindle. As I read, I highlight the key passages. I scroll to the spot, press the center button, press start highlight, scroll to the end of the passage, press end highlight. That saves the passage under my clippings. When done with the book, I attach my Kindle to my computer. I scroll to my clippings. I copy what I have and paste it into a Word document. So now I have all those passages saved and I can then adjust things there, add notes, whatever. And then finally I delete what I had under my clippings uh, in my Kindle so that I have empty space there for my next book. All this reflects today's society's major shift of storing more and more material electronically 
rather than in hard copy. Scams, the Microsoft Certified Technician. Watch out for scams. I'm guessing the most common one is that you click on something and an alert pops up, sometimes with loud beeping, and says something is seriously wrong with your computer and call this number and they'll fix it for you. But in reality, scammers have put some sort of malware onto your computer and they're trying to charge you to get rid of it. I got the warning you see here once when I clicked on a translation program. It wouldn't go away no matter what I did. But eventually it just went away on its own after about half an hour. A couple of other times I called a legitimate Microsoft number, but suspect I got passed off to a non-legitimate person who did not really answer my questions. And he was pushy. And he kept referring to himself as a Microsoft Certified Technician. He talked too fast. He was quick to ask, how would you like to pay for that, sir? And I hung up. And the problem went away on its own. If I have a serious problem, I find going to Best Buy is so much safer. Useful resources for me. Uh, let me mention an old standby solution. If something is weird and not working on your computer, close it down and reopen it. Rebooting your computer very often fixes any number of problems. I like Microsoft Edge, but when I browse the internet, I use Google. If I want a question answered, I Google it. But I also enter topics into YouTube, the YouTube search box, because visual learning is more effective than just text. Is you'll see that the knot gets tied basically upon itself. And then you can... If I have something wrong with my computer and just can't figure it out, I take it to Best Buy under my yearly service contract. I find they're very knowledgeable and helpful, and setting up a 15-minute appointment with them is fairly easy. Spelling and grammar check. I used to keep my spelling and grammar check function off because it makes too many suggestions for my taste, but lately I've been keeping it on because it does help in catching errors. Click File at upper left, Options, Proofing, keep these checked down here. Okay. Note that you have to start to type the next sentence before a grammar error gets underlined. I need an S here. And it doesn't always work. For example, I could type in cars was going everywhere and it doesn't flag it. Here are 10 more quick tips. The accent over the E. To get that accent, normally you go to insert symbol, select it after you find it. However, I find it's easier to type in the word cafe, which automatically puts in the accent, and then you just delete the letters you don't need. That way, you don't have to search all over the place to find the accented E, and it will automatically already be in the right font and size. Google Maps. I find Google Maps very useful. They are clearly drawn. You can zoom in and it shows you stores and points of interest. You can click here and it shows a satellite view. You can see, even see actual photos of a house or building. You can find directions by clicking here and putting in your destination.
iTunes search technique. When browsing for music on iTunes, I find that first, checking out an artist's chronological list of albums on Wikipedia for any latest release is very helpful. Programs, downloading or buying the disc. When I buy a program, I usually prefer to have a disc copy of the program instead of or in addition to downloading it over the internet. Because if something goes wrong with the program, I can just uninstall it and reinstall it from the disc to fix it. Whereas if I try to get it downloaded again from a company's website, I seem to constantly go in circles trying to download it again without having to pay for it again. Pronunciation website. If you want to know how to pronounce a word, try howjsay.com. It's very simple and straightforward. You Google the site, type the word into the box, click Submit, and the word gets pronounced clearly. Moot point. Of course, lately, as is so typical of the computer world, this website is suddenly not working for me. I click on Submit and nothing happens. But I found a nice alternative, a site I use all the time anyway, Dictionary.com. It has an icon right here for getting a pronunciation. Ascertain. Some guy commented on one of my videos that I sound like Christopher Walken. I don't think I sound like him at all. That's news to me. Shopping reviews online. I find Amazon.com a good place not only to buy things, but to get a good sample of customer reviews of a product. Text display modes. If your document text seems to refuse to cooperate with your display preference, it may well be that you accidentally clicked the website mode instead of the minus sign down here at the bottom right. They're right next to each other. Web mode on the right looks like this. Read mode on the left is like this. And print mode in the middle is the one you normally want. Lassoing technique. Uh, lately I've been moving multiple files and have become more familiar with how to lasso a bunch of files to move them. You don't have to put a rectangle around the outside of them. As long as you draw the rectangle through any part of a file, it will include that file as part of your group, which you can then just drop into your desired folder. Words suddenly spread out. If you have this very annoying thing happen, words suddenly spread out over the whole line, what happened was you accidentally hit shift and enter instead of shift and the quote mark key. They're right next to each other. Just do a control Z and hit the proper key this time. Outdoor computer use. Using a laptop outdoors is tricky because light reflecting off the screen makes it hard to see what you have on the screen. But I find it is doable with the right conditions. Number one, make sure the area behind you is dark. No dappled sunlight behind you. Two, wear a dark shirt. And three, if you're working with text, Increase the font size to maybe 16 point. Zoom in to maybe 170%. And make the background black. Sometimes when I record in public, I feel like people are spying on me, but it's probably just a little bit of paranoia on my part. 
In the memorable words of Mahatma Gandhi, What are you doing? You can't get out of here. Leave me alone. I'd like to finish on a philosophical note, which I think is very important. If you've seen, as I have, four people sitting at a restaurant booth, all four of them pecking away on their smartphones instead of talking to each other, something seriously wrong, something seriously dehumanizing is going on. I'm not a conspiracy theorist, but these companies are trying to make you addicted to their programs and their machines. David Letterman used to do this joke. He would tell people going to prison, remember, you do the time, don't let the time do you. <laughs> I would say, remember, you run the machines, don't let the machines run you. Thanks for watching.